Greetings, Wanderer, and welcome back to my lair. It is I, Remortis, Necromancer Extraordinaire. So you wish to learn more from the Necronomicon, eh? Well, today we shall go over the theory of blood. As mentioned before, the strength of spells wax and wane over time, meaning that some spells may be currently stronger than others. This is especially true for blood magic. Being overshadowed by bone and darkness, many overlook the potential of blood. Today, we will go over the fundamentals of blood magics to understand how the various blood builds work, so that when the time comes and the spells get some adjustments, perhaps the blood may see its time to shine. Let's get into it, shall we? Blood mancers use spells that utilize the overpower mechanic, as well as fortify and consuming blood orbs. The three main blood builds we'll be going over are Blood Surge, Blood Lance, and lastly, Blood Surge with Minions. For each, we'll go over their basics and which aspects and items you should look out for, and then lastly going over the Paragon boards for each. Starting with Blood Surge. The following spells are the core of this build. Blood Surge, obviously. Reap, Blood Mist, Corpse Explosion. Corpse Tendrils, and either Blood Wave or Bone Storm. Both has their merits depending on your gear and preferences. Essentially, the idea of this build is getting up close and personal and just blowing everything up. Rounding things up with your Corpse Tendrils and blowing it all up by alternating between Blood Surge and Corpse Explosion. This is a solo build, meaning that you'll have to sacrifice your minions to receive some benefits. For warriors, you can sacrifice whichever one you wish. They're all interchangeable and have its merits in the build. None of them really are mandatory, so you can alternate between the crit damage, the less magic damage, or even the increased shadow damage, because we do a little bit of that. For the mages, you'll be sacrificing your bone mages to receive maximum overpower benefits. And as for your golem, you can also interchange these between the blood if you want more health, which can mean more damage, or iron for more critical damage. Pick whichever seems to work better for you. Here are the core aspects of the build. Starting with Blood Bathe aspect, this will make your Blood Surge Nova strike twice with the second strike doing reduced damage. You want to put this on a two-handed weapon, or if you opt to use a one-handed weapon and a focus or shield, go ahead and put this on your amulet. That way you can get the most benefit possible to get more blood surge damage. The second aspect would be Aspect of the Embalmer. Whenever you consume a corpse with Corpse Explosion or Corpse Tendrils, you have a chance to spawn a blood orb. This is very vital to this build, as whenever you collect these blood orbs, you will increase your damage as well as give yourself Fortify, which will also increase your damage, and of course the heal you as well. For the Aspect of the Embalmer, you can place this on your helmet, chest, or legs. And the last one that's key to this build is Aspect of Grasping Veins. This aspect makes your Corp Tendrils increase your critical strike chance as well as your critical strike damage whenever you damage something with your Tendrils. So not only are you rounding them up and stunning them, you'll be inflicting much more damage. This is a very good aspect for most Necromancer builds, not just for blood. Now on to some of the interchangeable aspects, and as well as some uniques. First, we'll start with Aspect of Rasmus Chosen. Whenever your blood skills overpower, you gain attack speed up to 50%. This is very useful, especially on the Bloodlands build, but it can be useful on the Blood Surge too. You can put this one on your ring or gloves. The next one would be the Sacrificial Aspect. This will increase the bonuses of your sacrifice, if you see fit. You can put this on your ring, your gloves, or your amulet, but really our two options are the ring or gloves. Next is the Aspect of Untimely Death. For every percent of your maximum life you heal beyond 100%, you gain 0.5 overpower damage on your next overpowering attack, up to 60%. You could argue putting this on your amulet, however, I, I believe Bud Blade or Grasping Veins to be more important on the amulet. So for your aspect of untimely death, I would leave that to your rings or gloves. For your chest armor, you could either use the aspect of disobedience which will severely increase your armor by a considerable amount. Or if you manage to be lucky enough to find the unique Blood Artisan's Curus, 
This works very well with our build. Whenever we gather 10 to 5 blood orbs, hopefully you get closer to 5, you get a free bone spirit, which will deal maximum damage if you're at maximum health. Even if you don't have any points invested in bone spirit, this still can do pretty sweet damage, especially considering it's free. Another option for your pants, you could either run the Aspect of Disobedience, or you can run the Aspect of the Crowded Sage, which will drain life from opponents for each close enemy, and you're going to be close a lot. This will also work while you're in your Blood Mist as well. The Blood Soaked Aspect can be a decent aspect for this as well, since we'll be using Blood Mist quite a lot, and this will make it so your Blood Mist does shadow damage as well as negate your movement speed penalty. This is also very effective if you consider sacrificing your warriors to give you more shadow damage. And then lastly, depending on which ultimate you wish to use, whether it's Blood Wave or Bone Storm, there is the Tidal Aspect, which will make your Blood Wave shoot three times. And if you decided to go with Bone Storm, there are two decent aspects. However, for this build, the Aspect of the Shielding Storm is probably more useful to you, as you will get a 2-5% to barrier based on your life every time Bone Storm damages an enemy. Essentially, if you use this option, you'll be unkillable, more or less. As for items, we want to invest in items that give us more overpower damage. More damage with blood skills. More fortified damage. More fortified generation. More damage whenever you pick up blood orbs. As well as armor, maximum health, intelligence essence generation, increase more fortified contribution, and if you happen to find it, damage reduction from dot or damage reduction from shadow dot is also useful here since we have a little bit of shadow damage. Healing from blood orbs is okay, though it is not super pertinent for this build. Attack speed is also very useful too. As for unique items, as mentioned before, you could keep an eye out for the blood artisan's curious as well as temerity. And depending on your preference, whether you wish to use a two-hander, we will want to use a two-handed sword or a two-handed scythe. Both have their merits. The two-handed swords will always have more critical strike damage, whereas the scythe will give you more health on kills. On to the skill tree, which will be posted below for you to follow as you please. Just be sure to grab three points of hued flesh, three points of imperfectly balanced, three in grim harvest and fueled by death, 3 in Death's Embrace, Stand Alone, Memento Mori, and Inspiring Leader. Even though we're not using minions, we still benefit from the attack speed. Also, if you are running the Blood Artisan's Queer Ass, make sure to grab at least one point of the Bone Spirit and up to the Dreadful Bone Spirit upgrade, which will give us Essence Generation for free when it procs. Again, if you have any questions, by all means comment down below and I will reply accordingly. As for the Paragon board, we will be choosing the Blood Bath, Blood Begets Blood, Scent of Death, and Flesh Eater boards. In our first starting board, we will use the Territorial Glyph, which will increase damage we do to close targets, and if we fulfill the secondary requirements of 25 Dexterity, we'll have up to 10% damage reduction against close enemies. In the next board, Blood Bath, we will make sure to grab the Legendary Node Bloodbath, the Rare Nodes Thick Hide, Guarded Advance, Powerhouse, Hardened, and Remedy. As for the glyph on this board, we will go with Blood Drinker, which will increase the magic nodes within range by a certain percent based on the level of your glyph. But the main reason we want it is for the secondary effect if we meet the requirement of 40 intelligence, which will make it so blood orbs will fortify you for a good portion of your maximum life. This is very crucial to this build and most of these blood builds, as we'll be generating lots of blood orbs. On to Blood Begets Blood, we will be making sure to pick up the legendary node Blood Begets Blood. We will pick up the rare nodes Invigorated and Blood Empowered, as well as Aggression. In the Blood Begets Blood, we have our Dominate Glyph over there. And once you expand it, you'll want to grab all these willpower nodes nearby for increased overpower damage for every willpower node we select. And then we move on to the next board. To the north, we will grab Flesh Eater with the Flesh Eater legendary node and the Stifle rare node. And to the east of Bloodbath, 
We will take Scent of Death. We will make sure to grab the Scent of Death Legendary Node. And we will grab the Rare Node's Deathbringer. Preservation. And Death Marked. And the glyph we'll put here is the Undaunted. If every five willpower we purchase within the range, we will do 2% increased damage while fortified. And if we meet the secondary requirements of 25 willpower, we will gain up to 10% damage reduction while we are fortified. Again, if you guys have any questions about the Paragon board or the skill trees, please comment below. If you follow the board as I posted below, you'll see that there's 19 points available to spend as you please for when you upgrade your glyphs and you can expand them. And we can discuss it and I can help you guys out. The next build we'll go over is the Blood Lancer. This is an incredibly fun and fast paced build that is very reminiscent of a fast shooting turret and flinging bloody death wherever it goes. The core spells here are Hemorrhage, Blood Lance, Corpse Tendrils, Blood Mist, Corpse Explosion, and Blood Wave. You could replace Corpse Explosion and Blood Wave for the other skills if you desire, however, I really enjoy having the triple blood wave to keep your enemies at bay. If built properly, you'll be rapidly firing your lances at various targets and depending on how good your APM is, you can do some incredible work. This build has true potential. The aspects for the lancer are a little bit different from the blood surger. The key differences are that you will always be using a one-hander and a offhand, preferably using a focus and you can choose between a wand or a sword. The footage here is using a wand. As for the aspects, on your main hand or off hand, doesn't really matter, the two you're going to be running will be aspects of Rathmus Chosen. Whenever your blood skills overpower, you gain up to 50% attack speed. And the other weapon or off hand will be using Accelerated Aspect. Critical strikes with core skills will further increase your attack speed by 25%. We'll be running Aspect of Explosive Miss, Aspect of the Embalmer. We'll also be running the Aspect of Inner Calm because we will be standing still quite a lot. So getting extra damage for just standing still is quite nice for us. Aspect of Timely Death, Tidal Aspect, and the Aspect of Grasping Veins will all serve us very well. In this build, however, I strongly encourage using the Blood Artisan's Quicker Ass, mostly because we are generating so many Blood Orbs, it just makes sense to do so. Get all those free bone spirits and enjoy. Although you could replace the chess piece with something else as you see fit. Your gems will be going with overpower damage and armor uh, and gems in the armor will be a maximum life just to get even more damage. This is a range build. We're not trying to get up close. The reason you want a wand or sword is just because they're very quick and you want a focus offhand is because it will increase your attack speed even further. A shield will also increase your main hand damage, but it will not increase the attack speed as like a focus will. When looking for stats for a Blood Lancer, keep an eye out for attack speed, core damage, blood damage, overpower damage, critical strike chance and, and damage, as well as essence generation. Oh, and don't forget damage from blood orbs. The Blood Lancer build can be used with minions or without. While leveling up, you can certainly use your minions, but as you grow stronger, so will your enemies. And quite frankly, we do not have enough skill points to really invest in your minions to make them last long enough to make a difference. And we'll be attacking so quickly that essence generation will not be an issue, so we do not need to rely on the cold mages. The key skills we need to grab are Hemorrhage with the Initiates Hemorrhage upgrade. This build actually does utilize their basic attack quite often. Because of how quickly we're attacking, we'll be able to generate more blood orbs and get our essence back insanely quick while doing this. Obviously, we'll be doing the Blood Lance and we'll be using the Supernatural Blood Lance upgrade as it will guarantee an overpower every 8 strikes and spawn a blood orb. I really wish we could take Paranormal as well because having both of these would just make this build be insane. Make sure to grab Imperfectly Balanced, Hued Flesh, Grim Harvest, and Shield by Death. We'll be taking Blood Mist with the Ghastly Blood Mist upgrade. Corpse Explosion will be running the Blighted Corpse Explosion. Just that, that extra shadow damage and dot going on. And make sure to grab the Standalone and Memento Mori perks, as well as Inspiring Leader for further attack speed. As for the Paragon boards, the boards are almost identical. The only difference is that we are using the Sacrificial Glyph instead of the Territorial. Because we're going to be at range and we have no minions, so why not increase your damage for free? This build is incredibly fun, as I mentioned before. 
The gear I have here is not even optimized properly for Bloodlands, and it looks to be performing pretty solidly. I saw some decent numbers in there. Clearly not as big as Bone Bone Spear, but I believe out of all the builds I'm giving you here today, I believe this one has the most potential to be a very powerful route to go. That being said, it does have its weaknesses. It is a ranged build and cannot take a hit like melee, and because you're standing still as a turret just lobbing away blood lances, you are very susceptible for all kinds of damage and crowd control, so make sure you don't stand in the bad or you will perish. Don't be like me and try to get off a couple more blood lances before you die. Just get out of the way and keep firing. <coughs> I got so excited by that blast build I broke character. The final build I bring you today is one that requires the unique necklace Death Speaker's Pendant, which will cause Blood Surge to cast a mini nova on all of your minions at a portion of the damage, although it is increased by 10% for each target hit by the initial blast. That's right, bloody minions. I feel that this build has potential as well, especially when combined with the Ring of Men Down, which I have yet to acquire sadly, but I digress. This build will utilize your Reaper Warriors and Cold Essence Generating Mages. This build is something different from what is normally seen, combining the blood with your minions, which can make your talent choices quite taxing, since there's so many options that are so good to choose from. The core skills to use are Blood Surge, Blood Mist, Ray Skeletons, and your choice of Hemorrhage, De Decrepify, Iron Maiden, Corpse Tendril, or Corpse Explosion. Any of the combinations of those would work. You could use Iron Maiden or Hemorrhage for your Essence Generation and Decrepify, Corpse Tendril, and Corpse Explosion for whatever crowd control or extra damage do when you're not summoning Skeletons or Blood Surging. You could use the Golem, but I don't think we have enough skill or Paragon points to really spare to make him viable. Sorry, Vigo. Key stats we need to look out for are minion attack speed, overpower damage, damage with fortified, damage with minions, damage with mages, damage warriors, damage from blood orbs, minion life, healing from blood orbs, not as important, armor is always assaulted, minion armor, very important, fortify, minion damage reduction, essence generation, the weaponry we want to use are a wand and shield. A wand will give us lucky hit chance, which we're going to need to proc a few of our abilities, notably the Ring of Men Down. And a shield will give our minions and yourself a little bit more durability. You can use a focus if you want, but just be warned, a shield saves many lives. For the bloody minion skill tree, we're a little tight on points, unfortunately. There's so many things I wish I could grab. The key things to grab are the minion core skills, which are at the very bottom left. In Bonded in Essence, only one point necessary. Three points of Inspiring Leader, Hellbent Commander, and Death's Defense. This will make your minions be more durable and do more damage. Then also make sure you grab the blood core skills in the macabre section, which is uh, one point in gruesome mending, two points in transfusions, since blood orbs will also help heal your minions, tides of blood for three points, as well as coalesced blood. You can also put a point of drain vitality if you want, but I do not have a point to spare for it. Make sure to grab necrotic carapace, as well as increasing your warriors and mages and then depending on which spells you wish to take you could take the iron enhanced iron maiden so you can replace that as your essence generator you can use corpse explosion you can also use corpse tendrils for cc and blood orb generation also for increased damage if you're running that aspect on to the paragon board where things begin to be a little tricky much like our skill tree where we have lack of points, our Paragon suffers the same fate. Our first tree, we will use our Mage Glyph, which every time we increase intelligence will increase the power of our mages. And the secondary bonus gives them resistances. whoop de doo It might save them a little bit since they're more prone to standing in spells rather than being hit by melee. Nonetheless, we run Mage in the starter board. And then we will move on to either your choice of Bloodbath or Cult Leader. 
depending on your choice. You can go whichever route you want, but ultimately we'll be getting both. So make sure on if you take the Bloodbath board, make sure you grab Bloodbath, a legendary node. And for rare nodes, make sure you grab Powerhouse, Guarded Advance, Suffuse Resilience, Thick Hide, Hardened, and Remedy. And, and the glyph we'll be using in Bloodbath will be the Dominate Glyph. For every 5 willpower purchased within range, we will increase our overpower damage. And if we fulfill the secondary bonus, whenever you overpower an enemy, all damage that they take from you and your minions is increased by a quite a decent amount. Then on to the cultist leader. We'll be making sure to grab cult leader, as well as overlord, custody, puppeteer, infused caster, infused warrior, and lastly, armor clad. Pretty much every single node in this tree, at least the rare nodes. And for the glyph in the cult leader, we will go with dead razor, as it is nicely snug in between a few nodes that reduce damage for your minions and also increases their damage. And sadly, we'll be running out of points at this point. And then we'll move on to our last and final board in Blood Begets Blood. We'll be grabbing the legendary node here, as well as aggression for more overpowered damage, invigorated to get more damage when we pick up a blood orb, Take Blood Drinker, which will slightly increase our Blood Orb healing, and we won't be grabbing all the magic nodes around it. And then Blood Empowered, and which further increases our damage when we pick Blood Orb, and we'll pick up all the magic nodes around there. And as for the Glyph here, we'll be taking Blood Drinker, which will grant a bonus to all magic nodes within range. We're not too concerned with that. The main thing here is Blood Orbs will fortify you for a good portion of your life. Now, you will want to have this Blood Drinker online much earlier than saving it for this last board. So, you could use that in your first board, your second board, it doesn't really matter. But what does matter is um, keeping Dead Razor on the Cult board, that has to stay there. Alright, well, that's, that's the board. And again, if you have any comments or questions or advice, please leave them down below in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this chapter of the Necronomicon in all of its theories. I wish I had better materials and gear to truly test these different routes to find out their true potential. Perhaps you see it too. Perhaps you don't. Perhaps the gods will empower blood to be just as dominant as bone. Although, out of the three builds, I strongly think that Bloodlance will be up there. If not sooner than later, I think it has the potential now to overtake Bone if people are truly invested in it. And with that, we shall wrap up this chapter. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more. Farewell for now, Necromancer.